Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome back. Um, thanks for joining. Thanks for being here. Uh, I see a few uh, familiar faces. Oh gosh, the myth, the legend, the beauty and the beast have arrived. Mr. Tom Clark and the beautiful Lori Clodon. Hello, my dears. How are you? Hello. How are you? Uh, that, that cranky boy. <laughs> hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. Hi. Hey, hi, Ben. Hi, Say hi to everybody, buddy. Hi. Send you away to your mom. Um, so thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, being here. Thanks for joining. Thanks for uh, supporting. Thanks for helping. Anything from, um, you know, from uh, the wine industry to people uh, in these difficult times. And actually, I, I wanted to share a couple of, uh, of thoughts that I had because I had multiple emails today uh, actually showing uh, interest of people to start to go back into the economy, to go back to a normal life, to go back to, uh, you know, a non-COVID-19 habits and, and, and ways. And I thought it was an interesting idea, not so much that it should be done, uh, because I'm not sure, and it's not to me to decide if it is already the time or not. Uh, yeah, there's profession, professional Fauci uh, being one of them, and I really actually like the way he uh, he kind of discusses uh, you know all this through through that and, and always manages fairly well uh, both sides of the equation that's that's kind of interesting but a lot of people in the wine industry uh, have, have texted me or, or, or emailed me today saying hey you know, I think it's time for us to uh, uh, you know to go back to work could we uh, schedule uh, you know a session or a meeting and I actually told them that I would uh, I would keep on uh, not doing it and they could actually send me samples at home and I could do a blending session, a virtual blending session uh, in, in, in that particular way instead of exposing uh, me uh, uh, and others to, to that. So I don't know what you guys think. I don't know if you guys think it's a good idea or bad, but that was my, my kind of instinct was more today saying, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is important to, to stay, we're not, so far into into the second phase of this yet and i think it's a little bit better to stay home and and, and to protect to keep on protecting our elders and, and society in general so that was um that was kind of the um the the, the, the doubt that i had uh, you know a little bit here in california especially seeing these these curves but on the other side yesterday i tried to go on a walk with a uh, with chelsea and the baby and, and stuff like that and there was both rangers and sheriff Per, you know, per preventing people from actually, uh, uh, you know, attending and going and parking, uh, uh, you know, uh, along along the uh, uh, the parks and only parks that are in your neighborhood that you can access, uh, um, you know, completely, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, without taking your car and taking, uh, you know, uh, uh, vehicles and stuff like that are allowed, which was kind of interesting for me as well. Uh, but that's kind of, that was, uh, what about you? Uh, what, what do you guys think? I mean, unmute yourself and, and feel free to, to, to talk and, and, and express what you think. Well, I agree. I, agree. I completely agree. We just heard about a new person near here that has it. So it's, some yeah. So anyway, it's. But, so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a little bit before we talk about wine a little, a little bit different perception, uh, or, or in a different idea that I had as well. Uh, Lauren and Tom, I, I agree with this. I agree with you completely, and that's completely my strategy and my thought. But uh, when we are going to go and progressively put back uh, economy and probably uh, you know <laughs> age groups uh, you know that are less sensitive back into into the world. Uh, you know, we're going to have to expose people to build up the proportion of population that is actually immune anyway. So, so right. you know, it's going to have to happen because obviously the vaccine is not is not there yet. So that that's going to be a, you know, an, an interesting uh, thing because people are going to have to, and a portion of the population are going to have to contract the virus in order to become a society that is more immune. Right. It's true. I, I've told my kids I'm going to go expose myself and get it because our hospitals aren't crowded here yet. 
So I thought it was a good time to catch it while there were plenty of people to give me attention. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, it's, it's true too, right? I mean, I think honestly, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of an interesting way of, of, of seeing, seeing things and, and, and you know, uh, you guys know that I'm, I'm European of origin, and uh, and I've been uh, and I've been quite in touch with the rest, of the other part of the world, from my parents in Switzerland, sister in Barcelona, cousins in in Italy, and stuff like that. And we're seeing more and more uh, society starting to reopen aspects of, of 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 their country. I mean, Denmark has done it, the Czech Republic has done it, Austria has done it, and so they are already obviously to that second phase. And, uh, and, and and putting all this into into the equation. So again, it's not my job. You know, I just I just make wine for a living. It's a much easier solution. So, um, Jean, uh, yes. Scott, and Tammy Wingate here. We're so excited to see see you and, and uh, Clark and Claudin there. This is awesome. We're really appreciative that you're doing this. Uh, Jean, we we know you from uh, from Alpha Omega days. Yes. And uh, we met Laurie and Tom uh, a few years back and have been really enjoying their wines. In fact, we were introduced to Clark Claude and Wines uh, by a sommelier. We, t we said we, we liked uh, Alpha Omega Wines and he knew that you were helping them with their wines and introduced us to them a few years ago at a restaurant. So it was a, it was a fun time and we're really, really looking forward to hearing what you have. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks. It's a fun, it's a fun time for me as well, uh, honestly, because uh, I, I really enjoy these people. Uh, uh, um, you know, and, and as, as I said, the first time I tasted these wines on, on this platform, uh, you know, Tom and Lori has become, have become friends and, and really uh, uh, people that not only I trust, but also people that I really enjoy living with in, in, and having them in my life. Uh, uh, and it's something that is fairly important. Uh, uh, excuse my French, but I think in the winemaking world in my career, I have a no asshole policy. So, so I can promise you that Tom and Lori are with from that there are people that I actually love that I care about that I enjoy their presence even the grouchy the grouchy and and, and you know for gentleman farmer as, as, as he's, he's called sometimes Tom you know he's, he's a he's a really smart witty guy and and I really like that 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 sense of humor my, my sense of humor is always I, I always joke with people I love the most and I always joke with Tom and, and Laurie quite a bit because I just really love their what they have tried to accomplish. So these guys came in '74 to Napa, uh, you know, from from some some nonprofit uh, charitable work that they've done elsewhere. Uh, uh, and then I think in '79 they they started their uh, vineyard management company. In 1989, if I'm not mistaken, they purchased that amazing 117 acres. 18 of them are are are. Uh, are planted. It's roughly on the eastern side of 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 uh, how on the Blue Valley side of of, of our mountain. And really, it's it's a it's a little place of heaven, a place that reminds me quite a bit of of certain aspects of 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 of, of, of amazing terraces that you can see in where I come from in Switzerland, except. Uh, there, our terraces are actually walled, right? They are built. These terraces are built, but just with dirt. Uh, we, 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 it's so steep in Switzerland that you actually have to wall them uh, for many different reasons. But, but theirs are not. And all the diversity of exposure and, 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 and terrain is absolutely amazing. But what really strikes me in them is, is the feeling of, of time. Uh, they really put a lot of effort, energy, and, 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 and resources into the fact that it is not for their generation, it is already for their children and grandchildren generation. And I really enjoy seeing that because I think it's a huge part of, of, of the wine industry and the wine uh, regions. In France, we, we went through a really, really difficult time, to be honest, with that because the inheritance taxes were so high. A lot of family, uh, you know, had to sell their 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 uh, properties, their brands, their chateaus, their whatever they, they, they had because they didn't have money uh, for the next generation to pay all these taxes. Uh, and I think it's something that that is absolutely gorgeous when people are committed to do that and are willing to give it to the next generation and the next generation finds the interest in it as well. Uh, I think it's really cool that that they have that. And and for me, it's it's something that 
that uh, that that this is really touching my heart because they had difficult times in their lives and and they, it's to them to accept to talk about it and and and, and hopefully uh, Lori um, you you will come in and, and talk a little bit about you know the accident and other stuff like that that were really things that were not something that you read in the beautiful book of of ideal Napa Valley you know vintner life uh, and I think that that's that's something but despite all that the following generation I think Josh so 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 when when they had the vineyard management company they planted vineyards as great as, as Screaming Eagle and, and many others uh, they, so they, they have a very wide experience of, of everything in in the valley they have multiple sites they have you know they, they know the valley extremely well and that helps for their own farming to be to be frank and I think that's a, a benefit but in 2001 if I'm not mistaken uh, Tom decided to give it to Josh uh, and they're both Cal Poly grads nobody's perfect uh, <laughs> Uh, and then I can say that because I was this morning giving a class at Cal Poly actually through Zoom uh, to, to a bunch of, 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 uh, of students on, on, on communication and, and other stuff. So, so I love that place and I, and I consult at Tolosa right next to it as well. And then I really enjoy San Luis Obispo. So it's, it's actually quite a stunning, a stunning region. But, but uh, Cal Poly has an amazing program, believe it or not, it's actually joint with the the school where I did my study in Switzerland. So that's an additional, uh, you know, really positive things between Tom, Tom, Josh and, and Lori and I, it's, it's another thing that we share. Um, and, and, and these people are, have an amazing sense of, of, of legacy and building, I think, a family history. Uh, Lori and Tom, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about the accident that you referred to when, when we were developing the vineyard, our son Josh was about 15 and um, he was cutting wood to raise money for his first car. And he had a really, I'm not gonna go into all the gruesome details, but a really horrible tractor accident. And he, he wasn't expected to survive, but he did and he's fine. And you would never know that it happened except for the scar down his belly. But um, it, it was, one of those things that really makes you, again, remind you, kind of like these times with the coronavirus, it, it reminds you of what matters, you know, the things that really matter in life. And um, I don't know, I mean, if, if he hadn't survived, you wouldn't be talking to us because I would have insisted that we sell the property immediately. But um, anyway, that didn't happen. He's fine. Uh, he will never allow another wheel tractor on the vineyard. He's in his, um, let's see, how old is he? 45? 46. 46. Um, so since he was 15, there has never been a wheel tractor in the vineyard and there never will be. <laughs> so on the terraces, on the terraces. Yeah, they're, they're steep terraces. And it was a rainy day and the tractor slipped in the mud and just one of those awful things that bounced on top of him on its way to the pond. And luckily he wasn't still on it. Um, and he got help right away. We, we were there. We Anyway, I say I'm not going to go into the details, and then I start to do it. But anyway, well, yeah, you know, you know, Lori, Lori, I think I think one of the the details that 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 you didn't share, but but also is all the stories after, and 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 how how you made every everybody that was helping Josh after the accident aware of who you guys were, who he was, how, what was his name, and really bringing a lot of humanity into, into all the people. And, and it always took me, uh, when, when you taught me that, uh, because I kind of lived a, a fairly similar issue with my cousin last year. Uh, 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 unfortunately, that did not have the, uh, the same outcome because she passed away, but, but it was exactly that, is making sure that it is not a number like the one we see today with this horrible plague and somebody said actually uh, you know doctor physicians from the boston area is saying yeah stay home you know it's it's it protect the elders and yourself yeah. like, way too dangerous and and i again i will follow the orders because i am just a winemaker i don't save lives and thank you for all of to all of you that do um, because uh, without you and all the people that are putting themselves on the line i don't know where we'd be today so um so thank you most importantly to, to all of you 
Um, the other thing that Tom and Lori uh, uh, have, I think, is, is their wonderful uh, uh, legacy sense, but in, 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 the, in the side of, of nature as well. Uh, they always do everything on the property for the long term. Uh, Tom, when he gave the, uh, the company, the venue management company to his son, got really bored. You know, and he was really driving Lori crazy. And so they came to me for marriage council. And be so nice, no. be nice, be nice. <laughs> you, we have to do something for these guys to help them. So I said, why don't we get Tom to build birdhouses? So I found the passion of Tom to build birdhouses. No, so after he sold, uh, sorry, gave, gave the company, the vineyard management company to his son, uh, I, I, he actually paid even more attention to the sustainability of the property in the nature side of things and started building uh, birdhouses, starting bringing diversity in, in, in plants and orchards and animals, really trying to put this, this amazing property back together. And on a serious note, uh, you guys reach out to them. They'll they'll give you a vineyard tour. They'll take you around that beautiful property. They'll they'll taste with you, and it's absolutely mind blowing to be up there. It's 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 really soul um, invigorating, energizing uh, to be with them, especially with them on that on that great piece of land. It's roughly eighteen acres planted, uh, all in terraced. Uh, uh, Tom will talk a little bit about the about the, 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 the soil themselves. It's between 800 to 1,000 feet of elevation, and it is always the first uh, grapes to ripen. But uh, Tom, tell us a little bit more about these soils that you've been working for so long, and, and how much do you love what they give? What are the challenges and the qualities of that particular soil compared to the multiple soil you worked on? Well, as I mentioned before in the last uh, the last go around, it is a breast, it's called a Bressa Dibble complex. It's a shattered sandstone, uh, fairly fairly shallow. You know, there's no there's hardly any topsoil at all. It's just a shattered sand, sandstone material. And once we rip through that, that it gives a chance for the roots to get down a little bit deeper. But it does. Uh, we have to watch. You know, we have to watch our watering regime. And make sure we stay on top of it so that they don't uh, dry out too quickly. Um, it's well drained. And uh, it's a challenge when it comes to the, the middle of the summer, the later part of the summer, when it's, you know, when the reservoir is dropping and we have exactly enough water to irrigate for the whole season. So we have an 18 acre foot reservoir. And that's just about what you need for a season is about an acre foot of water. Um, and so it works out perfect. And we fill that reservoir with rainfall. You know, it's just a natural drainage area coming off the backside of Howe Mountain. And there's a series of three reservoirs that are above us. And so when they start to spill, it all spills into our reservoir and then down to another one after it leaves our reservoir. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge to monitor it and make sure that we have enough water for the whole season, you know, especially with Jean being the winemaker, um, he, he likes to let them hang a long time. So guys, uh, let, let, me, uh, let, let, let me correct uh, this statement right away from my dear friend Tom. So, because I need to explain something. Uh, Claire Claudon, uh, and I was going to talk about it on the cab, but since we're, we're jumping on that, on their particular estate, on this wonderful estate that has the cab, and I'll talk about the Sauvignon Blanc uh, right after that. It is the earliest ripening site that I have on Cabernet in the valley. It is picked between usually late August to mid-September. Uh, so the late picking that Tom has thrown at you is actually not really true. But Tom wants to be able to sleep in his two ears, as we say in French, and wants to harvest everything because as soon as harvest is over, he has nothing to do until the next spring, you know? And so he can go back to driving his wife crazy and mm -hmm. instead of, you know, attending the vineyard. So it's not a fair statement, let's put it this way, but yes, we do need water to maintain these really small berries. Um, I'm going to talk first. Let's switch back to the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, um, uh, and, 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 and we were drinking a, a Sauvignon Blanc 2018. It's a, from a vineyard uh, close by their property, farmed by, by the family, by, by Josh right now, called Benz. It's a really cool uh, uh, site. Uh, it, it's a much colder site in Pope Valley because it's stuck against certain hills. And it's really something that is giving 
a lot of fragrance. We actually have two sections, one muscadi, really flavorful, and then, and, and then another. And we pick at that different time to make them a little bit differently. Sauvignon Blanc is very aromatic, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a varietal that is extremely fragile. So, so you want to protect it. You, we direct press this because we want to maintain that acidity. We usually keep it away from oxygen because as soon as you have oxygen with Sauvignon Blanc, uh, uh, too much oxygen, you actually oxidize these aromas, these thiols and these esters that you're looking to, 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 to protect. And, and so we kind of keep it always under inert gas um, argon, nitrogen, and stuff like that to really protect the wine from being hurt because we want that exotic fruits, there is these uh, cassis buds, uh, you know, type of, of, of aromas. And we always want, of course, with Sauvignon Blanc as well, we want these really uh, sharp uh, type of acidity that makes it such a, a pleasant wine to taste and to drink. Uh, 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 and, and it is called Wild, wild Iris. Uh, Lori, tell us why. Well, on the property, as, as John has said, most of the property is just wild. And um, in the spring, at the same time that we release the wild iris, we have wild irises that pop up in the woods that surround the vineyard and in the, the, the little tributaries. tributaries. Um, and so Tom wanted to name it wild iris and iris would be a blonde woman running through the vineyard naked. And I decided to call it wild iris the flower. <laughs> so. But mine would have been a lot more fun. <laughs> and probably would have sold out right away. <laughs> probably wouldn't, but there, there's actually everywhere along these roads, if I'm not mistaken, in English, a, a flower called a naked lady, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, they're beautiful, beautiful flowers that, 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 that I really enjoy along the roads of, 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 of Napa as well. And so well, we actually thought about actually doing the wild iris with the blonde hair running through the vineyard, but um, you know, the, the government doesn't allow you to have naked people on their labels, but a friend of ours had a label with a naked Marilyn Monroe. And so what she, they did is they put a sticker on it of a dress and once you got it home, you could peel that off. And there she was laying on, what, what was that famous picture? Was it an <laughs> animal rug or something? Anyway, but they'd already done it, so we, we couldn't do it, so. That's a pretty, uh, pretty cool marketing, uh, you know, mar marketing uh, uh, idea, actually. I really like seeing creativity. Uh, one of the, the things that, that, that is very creative with, with Jacques Laudon for me, and that always has been is, is how simple and how elegant their label and their bottle shape is. You know, it's something that, that is really, as, 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 it's so different than, than many, and I really enjoy that, that, that design quite, quite, quite a bit. Um, I, have a, I have a question uh, for you, I think, Tom, uh, instead of me answering all the time, will the roots ever grow deep enough to not require that you water? Um. Only in the only in the deeper soiled areas that are down below, as the you know as the mountain slopes down towards the bottom where the reservoir is, uh, that in that particular area, you know where I'm talking about, John. It, it, yeah. It does get more a little more shade, and uh, the the soils are deeper there, and and that that does not need to be watered as much. And so I do cut I do have valves on those particular rows that I I turn off the water on those and do not water those later in the season. But um, those are about the only areas that you that uh, that reach down deeper. You know, the with 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 no rain, with no rain, guys. Let's say from I don't know May first or April fifteen, depending on the year. Uh, uh, from April fifteen to roughly, uh, you know, so, uh, let's say at least October fifteen, October twenty first, something like that. Uh, usually in most years, when you have very steep terrain with draining soils, not a high content of clay, uh, the plant has a really difficult time retaining that water. So it would be possible to actually do a dry farm. You would have to train the plant progressively at the very beginning, but your yields would be dramatically low. I mean, right now at Clacredon, we're at one and a half ton to two tons to the acre max. If you were to do something like that, you probably be at a half a ton to three quarter of a ton to the acre. 
the business side of things would be also really, really difficult. So, uh, you know, when it's sloped like that, water evacuation is a big factor and it's really difficult to do dry farm on, on these particular terrains. Yeah. Um, One of the things that we learned from Frederic and Jean, Frederic is a winemaker that Jean works with and used to work with Jean with our fruit also. But one of the things they taught us that I find amazing is if you look at a terrace vineyard like ours where there, we did contour planting, so it contours the, the hillside. And the end row, because of that, or the end vine gets more water than the vines in the middle of that row. And the end vines actually ripen later than the row, the vines in the middle. And so of course this is a this is horrible for the poor people who pick this vineyard because we end up saying, well no, just pick the middle of the vine. We'll pick the ends of the vine later. But when you're a small um, boutique artist and winery like like we are and like John is creating for us, um, you can be that particular and so we're that particular. Yeah, it's, it's very meticulous, right? It's just because, uh, you know, uh, they, they get so much more water because there's not another plant on the other side, right? So, so right. And these end vines are always a little bit more vigorous, a little bit more right. uh, care, fruit carrying and, 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 and it usually delays uh, the ripening quite a bit. And so it's kind of good to push back, uh, you know, the date of picking, it drives Tom even crazier, which is awesome. It's something we all want. And so we, we you know, we, I'm used to it. Uh, I'm used to it. I am completely used to it now. It's just like normal farming to me. You know, we flag, <laughs> we flag certain rows and certain vines and we don't touch them until the very end. When I call you for the fifth time, I say, okay, can we pick them now? And you go, <laughs> okay. Pretty um, end. Um, so, so to finish off on the, on the, on the wild iris, uh, you know, one of the things that we do is mainly uh, mainly stainless steel with a little bit of wood, especially acacia wood, uh, to give a little bit of that honey-like. But also we do a lot of lees work, right? It's not because you have that freshness that you can't have roundness on the palate. So we use the lees to sometimes coat. But because when you start making wine in a brand, you have to taste back to see what was done before to make sure you don't dramatically change the DNA of a brand. I have to say that Claire Clodon is one of the Sauvignon Blanc that I make that is usually a little bit more on the acid driven side, not so round because that's the style that they want. And it's also what dictates in the vineyard because that part, uh, that, 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 that section of the vineyard uh, with these, these, this clone that is, is so much more expressive, we want to protect that and we don't want to tame these notes uh, with more lees work. So we tend to protect a little bit these, these aromas without using so much lees work on, the, on, on these. So I think that's, that's something to definitely something to, to mention on these wines. Can you explain why the eternity is so smooth while the estate Cabernet is much more tannic? Mm -hmm. Is this simply based on less skin contact on the eternity versus the estate? Or does the eternity fruit come from a different area in the vineyard, which has thinner skins? Um, obviously, that is somebody that knows wine fairly well, so it's a great question. Thank you for asking. I, I thought you were asking me. I'm <laughs> glad that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that one is, is, is straight for me. No, so, so there's two things. Uh, uh, eternity we started doing when we were uh, when when uh, in 2009 because we wanted actually on purpose a wine that did not sweat the DNA of this property and wanted to give a little bit more softness and roundness. So I will actually answer your question uh, while I speak about the Cabernet because you understand and at different points I will come back. And today we're drinking the Estate Cabernet 2016. Uh, um, and you, it's actually a segue and, I, and I could, you should go on payroll with me because it's exactly that what, that I wanted to talk about. The greatest thing I enjoy the most of all of the wines that we make at Clerc Clodon is actually the DNA, absolutely undoubtable of the Estate Cab. And why? Because we have because of the site, because of that soil, because of that drainage, because of the sun, the smallest berries that you will ever see. 
right? As I, as I said in the past, berries are between 0 0.8 grams to 1.4 on Cabernet Sauvignon per berry. At their vineyard, and that drives, you know, Tom especially crazy yield-wise, uh, because the, these tiny berries are, don't weigh as much, obviously, but it makes that it's really concentrated, powerful wines. Why? Everything you look for is in the skin. So if you think about it, if you have a small berry, you have more skin for less juice. Therefore, you're going to have more tannins, more aromas, and more power, right? So at Clark Lodon, because you have these tiny, tiny little berries, and on the estate tab especially, you have that very high tannin original content. I'm going to explain another, another fact because it's something that I studied that made me laugh a lot. In Bordeaux, you are at 1,000, 1,500 milligrams of tannin per liter. After three days of Cabernet Sauvignon of Clark Clodon, you're at 3,000 milligrams. So twice the amount. So then it is my job to make sure that we coat them, right? That we, we kind of bind them. It's called polymerization. It binds with color components, tannins, polysaccharides, uh, to make the wine a little bit softer. But on the estate cap, it is so present, so lush, so, so powerful. Uh, and these berries are so tiny that it is one of the only brands that I don't use barrel fermentation much on their estate cab. Why? Because I want that DNA to sweat out, that sense of identity. And I think that in an era of globalization, it's really important to show something different, something that has, that, that has a lot of uniqueness, right? And that Cabernet is made in, in, in tank because it actually expresses itself better in tank, which is not as oxidative where you don't have as, as much power, but it is very, very high volume extraction at the beginning to polymerize, to bind these tannins more, even more than in barrel fermentation. But the problem with barrels is when you do barrel fermentation, you actually add more tannins. The tannins from the wood so in order to protect that and not have as many tannins on that estate cab that already has that structure, uh, you know, in place naturally, we actually make it only in stainless steel. So to come back to the question of the eternity, the eternity is made in, uh, uh, with barrel fermentation, has a little bit of petit verdot and is picked not only from the vineyard at their house, which is a different vineyard, it's very partly true, so you see that you are partly correct, but also from, of course, the estate, but usually the riper, the rounder, the more bigger, lusher berries that we have on the property because we wanted the eternity to have a distinct different profile, not to be almost like, no, to maximize these type of differences to make sure that we, you, ultimately, the drinker, the buyer, the collector, the family, enjoys these very different aspects, these very different profiles. And when you taste their estate cap, it is year after year after year after year on the market, tasted by sommeliers, consumers, other winemakers, press, etc., etc., always it is a very, everybody says it's a very distinct wine. And I think that's honestly a, a gift. It's a blessing uh, when you think about it because there's nothing like it. And it is for me a really almost Bordeaux-like expression of Napa. And why am I saying this? Because I, you, Jean, you're stupid. Yeah, I am, but that's a different story. And I know Tom, you're gonna jump on that. I have two brain cells, we agree. But I only have two brain cells, that's fine. But think about it. In Bordeaux, the expression of tannins on young wines are there, are always there. It's part of the equation. You don't have the ripeness that you have in Napa. But on Cla at Claire Clodon, on their estate cab, you have that lushness, you have that ripeness. But because of that particular soil and these particular draining soil slopes and terraces, you have that power and concentration of tannin. Guys, Claire Clodon gave me the only, the only, and they don't even know because I didn't tell them, uh, and, and you should see their face when I do. I, it's the only injury 
that I had in my entire life making wine. And what did happen? I was chewing on a berry before harvest and the berry was so small that all that was inside was really the seeds, right? And a tiny bit of pulp. And the seed actually punctured my palate and I started bleeding everywhere, you know, uh, because of that. So that's the actually only time I got really hurt is because Clarkonos grapes are so different, so concentrated, so small that mm -hmm really have to manage them in a different way and it's kind of it's kind of a cool story because it really represents uh, you know you know uh, uh, really well i think uh, um, uh, what that that wine is about and then of course after you know because there's so much tannin so much power in these wines we extract early really early in the process of winemaking before there's too much alcohol. Because when you have alcohol, you dissolve tannins more. So we try to extract a lot up front and then very little at the end. And we often drain fairly fast on the estate cab, not to have too much, not for the tannins, not to be overwhelming, uh, over, overwhelmingly, whatever it is, uh, uh, big and powerful and, and, and huge. So, so we manage the extraction very differently than anything else. And I think that's one of the reasons why it makes these, these kind of uh, extremely unique profile. I had the pleasure and talked to, to Laurie and, and Tom about that. I had the pleasure of doing a vertical of every single vintage of over the years that I've been working with. These wines are such ageability worthy it is absolutely amazing. I'm, you guys know, I'm an aging freak. I love older wines. I really drink a lot of old wines. That's what I think is the, and to be able to taste wines that I had nothing to do, guys, and nothing to do with. And 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 and, 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 and then back in the beginning of, of Claire Clodo and through these, this 90s era and stuff like that, where you get these wines that are completely full, still holding, holding together. It's it's something that is really, really unique and really something that I that I enjoy. So Laurie and Tom, thank you very much. Somebody said that they only have one brain cell. Uh, Jonathan, that's not true. I, because of your, of your remark and question, I can tell you have more than one uh, um, because at least sometimes they connect and they create a sparkle, which is always uh, an interesting thing for me. Um, would you compare the estate wine to a priorat wine because of the small berries, et cetera? Wow, I'm having smart people tonight. <laughs> It's probably because it's not my platform. It's probably Claire Claudon that brings all these IQ in. Um, uh, great question, um, Jeff. Yes, on different varietals, you're right. And I was actually thinking about making a, a, a similarity and an analogy between Priorat and, and Napa with, with Claire Claudon. Uh, because in Priorat, you have no topsoil. So you have only these slates. Uh, these, 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 these extremely uh, uh, rocky soils that makes that the plants are extremely um, f f fragile, not vigorous at all, and produce, oof, if they produce a half a ton per acre, uh, you're, you're happy. So yes, there are similarities in that. You're absolutely right. But for the fact that Priorat uh, has a little bit of Cabernet, but mainly it's of course uh, Carignan Grenache, and these are usually a little bit bigger berries. Uh, uh, on the Cabernets of Priorat, yes, you do, but uh, in, in, in a lot of, a lot of places, uh, you know, when you see Priorat slope, uh, it's not even mechanical. You have to do it by hand in a lot of different places in Priorat. And, and it's kind of a similar, a similar thing. Okay. To the point, guys, and I can tell you a little story that I learned because that's... <laughs> why I love so much what I do. I was walking, uh, you know, the, um, the vineyards in Priorat, and it's steep, it's tiring. And, and, and they actually, uh, the slope is so big that they sometimes have to put stones or sticks so the vine doesn't fall and starts growing underground wow. and ultimately dies. So in order to push the vine in these slopes that are so, so steep, they have to, you know, dig around and put kind of a fortification 
to make sure that the vine keeps on growing outward because it's so so bloody steep that the vine wants to go you know along along the um along the uh, the, the 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 ground the floor the the soil and so yeah there's a lot of similarities in that um jo jeff hampson could you imagine if they decided to make an Amarone style wine using the estate grapes. Mm. There might be only three cases made total. Yeah, that's a good point. We could make an Amarone style. So Amarone is a really, uh, again, and, and I'm gonna modify that, that, that saying for, for, for one thing. Amarone is much more than sweetness and is much more than overripe grapes. Really good Amarones are actually not heavy. They're really ripe, they're very lush, but that acidity balance brings you to, 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 you know, to, to, to the wine to finish, to finish the bottle. So it is true. It'd be kind of fun to do an Amarone. And I'm pretty sure that uh, my dear friend Tom would probably kill me if I were to tell him that we're going to wait for a portion of the vineyard to, given, to be even more ripe uh, than it is before. So if that's the case and you guys want that Amarone wine, uh, I will say goodbye because I'll die before the next, uh, the end of the next harvest. But uh, we can try for sure. I'm, sure. I'm sure that knowing Tom and Lori, they'd be like, okay, yeah, let's try. It's a good idea. So we can do it. I'm all in. But we do trust you. That is the problem. <laughs> yeah, it is a problem, actually. It is a problem. You should never trust me. I'm swift after all. Come on. Um, isn't, isn't oak needed for aging or did I misunderstand you about the use of oak? Uh, you did misunderstand. I don't do barrel fermentation, meaning I don't ferment in a 60 gallon barrel uh, like I do with, with Eternity and I do with a lot of, of Napa Cab because it really integrates, but I age in it. Big difference, and you're correct. So the impact of the wood is there in doing the aging. That is a really smart uh, comment. Again, you guys are so much smarter than me. But you mitigate two things. First, you mitigate the use of new oak versus old oak. And, 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 and that dramatically changes your impact of the tannins of the, of, the, of the wood. And then you also mitigate how much and if you stir the leaves to coat these tannins when the estate cab actually gets into these barrels and the coopers you use. You will hear me say, and I consult for coopers, uh, so, so I, I got to design certain of the barrels that I work with myself with different forests, different woods, different uh, aging, seasoning, and stuff like that. Uh, but certain barrels give you more mouthfeel because the toasting level eliminates certain of these wood tannins, right? So on a thing like the estate cab of Clercredon, you pick usually barrels, uh, barrel sources, that are a little bit more mouthfeel driven and not as tannic driven, right? And usually, instead of a medium toast, you take a medium plus, so you get rid of some of these big, uh, the big tannins of the, um, of the, of the wine. Uh, there's more, there's more question. I noticed that the Eternity has a lower percentage of Petit Verdot now than in the earlier vintage. What is the reason for that? Um, well, so if I actually told you how much Tom um, sometimes sleeps on the step of my house, uh, on my doorstep, uh, to wait for me to wake up, to tell me to pick that Petit Verdot. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because Petit Verdot is a great addition, but Petit Verdot has a great impact at a very low percentage. And we already have so much structure in these wines, so much power, that we don't need the power of Petit Verdot to these level most years. I won't say always because it's never a recipe, but I think most years it's better to be able to express the true identity and they have Petit Verdot, really good Petit Verdot on the property, but sometimes I like a little bit less because we already extract that density and that power in these wines. Um, where are the wild iris grapes from? From Ben's Vineyard, uh, about what would you say guys, two miles, three miles away from your, your property? Out, but it's on the valley floor of Pope Valley, so it's quite a bit different from where the Cabernet is grown on, on the estate vineyard. It's a wonderful little vineyard. It, it, in fact, 
we, it's kind of funny. First, we said we're never going to make wine. We're just going to grow grapes. And then we said, well, we're never going to make a white wine. We're just going to make red wine. And this never goes on and on. But I'll stop at the white wine part. Part of the reason we decided to make wild iris was because we needed a white wine when we did winemakers dinners. We had been trading with people and we decided, you know, if Josh has a vineyard that would be a great vineyard, if he has one under management that would fit, then we should go ahead and do this. And when we found out that we could buy fruit from the Lamb Ben's vineyard, that, that clinched the decision. It's, it's a really little vineyard in Pope Valley that, um, and we know it's, it's being farmed exceptionally because Josh is farming it. So we still have control over the fruit that's going into our wines and that- and I mean, It's also a colder spot in, in, in Pope Valley, really tucked into the hills uh, that, that really protects the integrity of the, uh, of the Sauvignon Blanc, I think. And that's really something important about that Ben's Vineyard uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for me. Uh, there's somebody that said a uh, really uh, interesting remark from Las Vegas, because I know the guy. Uh, he said, too bad you don't make bad wines at Clark Claudon, or I could use them to do sanitizer with. Uh, and he actually, owns, <laughs> he actually owns, the guy owns a distillery in Colorado and actually stopped distilling to create sanitizer for that, for the healthcare system there. So. Yeah, the sad thing is that wine doesn't have enough alcohol in it to actually work. As yeah, a, but you just uh, you just have to distill it. It's, it's a yeah, very, exactly very easy process when you have a distillery with, like that. This Swiss guy that 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 is just uh, uh, talking from from uh, uh, Colorado for sure. There's another another question or another part of that question. How would you describe the smell of the sixteen estate cab? Well, I I, I describe it with a, a pine wood, cedar, dry cranberries. Uh, so kind of a balance between oak and actually more red fruits than than uh, than uh, than blue fruits, to be honest with you, and a lot of lot of spices, and I kind of enjoy that uh, quite, quite a bit. It's a it's a fairly complex nose, and I'm going to tell you and you guys, you, you, we we know how we taste wine. It's very it's a very personal. It's a, it's it's a really uh, yeah it's 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 an emotion uh, ultimately, and we all each have. The way I really enjoy wine is when I can smell or taste the wine and I can actually pick up 10, 15 different characteristics. But I know there's so many more behind. And that's how I actually calculate, estimate complexity of a wine. And when I take that 16 cab, you have these... Uh, yeah, woody notes, cedar notes, uh, 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 pine, uh, pine, uh, no, but but uh, kind of Christmas tree sapine in 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 French. Uh, you have all these notes uh, combined with a fresh uh, but dry cranberries, as I said, and 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 you even have some some a uh, little bit of hints of blue fruit, but but very subtle, very very well integrated, not too much of anything. It's for me a really a, one of these wines that is fairly cerebral. If I, if I say it's not, oh, I pick it up and it's all in your face and, and look at my cleavage, it's beautiful. No, it's much more, uh, you know, much more elegant, a little bit more, uh, you know, put together and you have to, to look for these notes and have to kind of really describe, uh, you know, and, and, and put some thoughts into the wine. And I think that's why I really enjoy the, the, the wine. And to be honest, I mean, I've, I've been a fan of the wines even before I was working with them, which is kind of a cool thing. The Estate Cab is a Bordeaux style wine. If I had to explain this wine to someone fond of French wine, how would you describe it in terms of the Cab left bank focus and particular region would you say is similar to? Well, the first thing I would do, dear sir, uh, uh, or dear madam, is this. Try to contact Lori and Tom and get some older vintages. Because Napa older vintage made like this is a blessing. And is a blessing that will age greater than many Bordeaux. And during aging patterns, you actually get closer to have the expression of a European wine, Bordeaux or other, more than a Napa one. But if you go and taste this today, right, which is fairly young, it's 2016, so obviously it's not that old, 
But it is for me more Poyak driven. I worked at Poyak at Lynch Bash for, for a while. And, and, and so for me, it's a little bit more Poyak Saint Estefe than anything else. But if you want to really push, because once you put it on the palate, you see and you can taste that it is uh, from a little bit warmer, riper climate than Bordeaux most of the years. Of course, not the big year, 2013, for example, where they had the big heat spells. But if you actually put this wine, you'll kind of get a hint that it's probably not from, from, from Bordeaux, or at least from Bordeaux in a normal year. Uh, and if you actually age it a little bit longer, you will fool anybody. And I, I told you guys many times, it's fairly easy to get fooled at blind tasting. I get fooled on my own wines on a regular basis, uh, you know, so it's absolutely fine. It keeps you humble. You move on and you continue. But that's also one of the, you know, of the lessons to learn when you make wine is to stay with both feet on the ground and, and fairly humble. And that's one of the things that we appreciate about Jean, because he is... Oh gosh, now I could just go on and on, but he is one of the most amazing winemakers in the Napa Valley, and yet he's not one that's always out there tooting his horn. And um, we're really, we're really fortunate to have him. It's it's part of what keeps us going in making wine. I mean, Tom and I aren't spring chickens, obviously. And most you are. Just I, not am, I am. I will always be. But anyway. <laughs> You know, most people our age, you know, we having come here in 1974, there's so many people that we have known in the wine industry who have have gone. Either they've passed away or they have decided to sell and, and get out of the industry. But, you know, we, I, we often say this isn't just a lifestyle, it's our life. And that's something that John appreciates and he experiences it the same way. So to be able to share that, with your winemaker is something pretty special. And it's, it's what feeds his passion. And I, I think you can all see his passion. It's pretty evident. Well, th thanks. I, it, it, it goes straight to my heart. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Laurie, it's just, I just don't think I'm better than anybody else. And I think that's kind of the philosophy of, of life that I have. And, and, and I just constantly try to, to improve uh, in, in, in tasting, you know, putting that 2016 cab on, on the mouth. Uh, again, you have that lushness. So we did kind of coat these tannins to make it fairly integrated. And, 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 and it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice bottle of wine. Honestly, it's a nice bottle of wine. It's well balanced. It's, it has that power. It has a little bit of silkiness, a little bit of sexiness on the palate without being vulgar. And, and for me, it's, it's kind, of, kind of fun. How would you compare the 2017 and 18 Wild Iris Vintage? To me, they are very different. Uh, they are, and let me tell you one, one thing. Uh, and let me tell you a very simple statistics that will make you understand why they're different. In 2017, over Labor Day weekend, we had 10 days in a row over 100 degree Fahrenheit. So that alone dramatically changed the profile of these wines. 18, on the other side, had a very consistent growing season with no big heat spell, right? So you had to manage that. So usually 17s that went through that are a little bit warmer. Usually that, get, that Sauvignon Blanc is picked by that time and, 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 and doesn't get that. But 17, you had fairly high temperatures overall. Uh, the other thing also is you, you adapt. And I think uh, it is always a question as, as a winemaker, and especially if you work with people that have the legacy and history of Tom and Lauren, it's always a question, do you make that personality? Do you continue making these wines in that style? Or do you change sometimes the style to maximize the potential of the vintage? And, and I am of saying, you, my, I don't have the power and, and, and for sure not the intelligence of changing what nature gives me through soil and climate. So I just have to grab what it gives and maximize its potential. And so I think it's really important to be able to do that constantly and maximizing that potential. So that's how, you know, for me, these two wines are extremely different is they were in very different season, made a little bit differently uh, uh, because of that. And that changed the profile to maximize the potential of that particular year. 
Yeah, what I always say is that uh, winemaking is a dance with Mother Nature. And you need to dance and every season's different. Every season is a different tune that you're dancing to. So if you figure out that dance rather than try to manipulate it, um, you can make great wine. Yeah, and, and, and I'm sure if you go visit Tom and Laurie and Laurie at the at the property, Tom will do a little dance for you. <laughs> I will. He will. Definitely. <laughs> and we'll 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 teach our goats and our llamas to dance too. Just oh yeah, they've got goats, llamas, beehives, uh, everything you need, everything that is needed to to sustain a healthy uh, property and 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 a nature driven one. Honestly, it's it's they have everything. They have. They even have rattlesnakes, but that that's a different story. Yeah. And bob and bobcats and mountain lions and coyotes and bears. Bears, yeah, they have it all. <laughs> all right. Any other question, ladies and gentlemen? Well, thank you very much all for coming. Tom and Laurie, thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for enlightening us all with. I don't know, your passion, your legacy, I guess, your, your great trip, your great uh, adventure of, 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 of that beautiful thing that you're giving us and the ability to, to drink these amazing, well-grown grapes. Uh, honestly, it's fun. And, uh, and you guys know how much I love you, so nothing else to say. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Safe Take care, guys. Cheers. Safe hugs. Bye. Stay healthy, everybody. Uh, thanks, guys. Bye. Oh, blue lights on your arm. As soon as I close it, you'll see when I leave the meeting.